is this the Actress VK Baby and I'm back again with another video. This is my reaction part 2 to the Nostalgia Critic Fox Kids. I had to do a little bit more parts because my camera eventually didn't have space. But I found a way to give it more space. If you're new to this channel, click the like button, the subscribe button, and follow me on Instagram for you can you can vote for how many more videos you want me to react to comment which videos you want me to react to so let's continue let's continue where I stopped thanks he was an egotist but still valued his bizarre ethics it made him both funny and intimidating at the exact same time and nowhere is the series complexity shown best than in its series finale where Peter decides he does want to grow up and he starts to wither away into an old man, unaware that he's actually taking Neverland with him. So you could argue Hook was being portrayed even before Hook was doing it. It's surprisingly intense and unbelievably well done. It lasted for only one season, but it resulted in a ton of episodes and had a pretty good life in reruns. Criminally, though, there is no DVD release of it. If you're able to find it on YouTube or anywhere else, definitely watch as many of them as you can. It's a cannonball of imagination waiting for you. That's all fine and good, but what about the poor people who demand a series about demonic fruit? What? I had no segue into the show. So, um, because we apparently demanded it, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was given its own cartoon series. Based on the B movie. I'm not irritated by the video. I had some my like, blaster music passing the house. This is what you get when you try to record your video midday, but... The comedies, it did have some of the original characters like Igor, Terra, that parachute guy, and even John Astin reprising his role as the mad scientist who made the evil vegetables. Fruit. It's 2018, nobody uses that term anymore. It certainly had the strangeness of the films down, but it didn't have much more beyond that. The plot is similar to the movies in that a mad scientist wants to take over the world with the tomatoes and his failed experiments, Terra and FT, and tomato war veteran Wilbur tries to stop him. He gets help from the main lead, a boy who was not in the movies, and you can clearly see why. He's pretty bland and forgettable, and the animation doesn't do him or any of the other characters any favors. You know you're supposed to stay away from salt? If someone sees you... What is up with this girl? Is the binary code on her neck being hacked? Must blackmail George Clooney with Return of the Killer Tomatoes footage. You! Zucchini! Look at this scene. She has to lean over to talk to FT, but look how she does it. Ah, I can't wait to get back to my usual filming space. I love home, but home is just too noisy. Alright, Pikachu. I'm talking to an animated character. Okay. It's Igor! Dr. Gangrel! What the hell? Is this part of the joke or is it just poorly animated? The whole show is kind of like this, leaving you with no idea what's intentional and what isn't. Even the dialogue, you can't figure out what they're aware of and what they're not. Being a luscious, ripe tomato can be hard on a girl. Whatever you're thinking, erase it from your heads. I had a line about her being saucy, but never mind. One weird cartoon. <laughs> That's one cartoon we didn't watch growing up. Mm. On. I guess on a level of bizarre awkwardness, I can see this entertaining a few, but for many kids, the most memorable part of the show is the theme song. But goddamn, that's a catchy theme song. <laughs> Show started off on Fox Kids. Beetlejuice! A charming story about a dead man who befriends an underage girl he was going to marry. Finally, somebody who gets it. Do I have to worry about you? You might. <laughs> Beetlejuice had only the slightest connection to the movie, which was surprisingly welcomed as it allowed for a lot of wild and inventive designs. Granted, in the movie, everyone looks the way they do because they died that way. Here, I don't know how the shit they were supposed to die to look like this. Tim Burton himself helped design the show, and it certainly shows in all the strange people and creatures. It had little in terms of plot, but it had a lot in terms of visual and gross-out humor. At a time especially when there wasn't much in terms of dark or macabre cartoons, this one gave us a small but still memorable taste of the enjoyably morbid. It was a waste of time, but it was a fun waste of time. <laughs> Plant wraps. No! Yeah! Little 
Shop is based on the musical interpretation about the man-eating plant. <laughs> this must have been like the early 90s. <laughs> like, when I mean early 90s, I mean like 1992, 93, 94. Because when, when... 1997, 1998, 1999 came around when I was a baby. None of these weird cartoons were on TV. I mean, there were a whole lot of Go Go Power Rangers and Scooby Doo, but nothing like a weird plant. Maybe I'm pushing the envelope. I'll shut up. Except Seymour is now a little boy, the plant raps instead of sings, and absolutely none of it looks completed. This looks more like the bumpers you see before they go to commercial. You don't give those bumpers enough credit. The focus of the show is the plant is trying to get Seymour to win the girl and defeat the bully while also running a plant shop that's constantly infested with band musical numbers. My vision says a bunch. God, I wish this had the original cinematic ending. Why is he even shocked the plant is talking? The flowers act as backup singers all the time. I'm not even sure the plant is talking, his lips move so rarely. I guess I can give credit that for a show that had a budget of monkey feces, the backgrounds are at least creatively simple. I mean, I'm sure the Leia artist had two minutes to color these on Mario paint, but there is at least a little structure in between the poorly animated sections. Oh god, he's having a stroke. Nope, that's just a bad show. The writing doesn't make any sense either. The girl in the show is obsessed with a refrigerator. I'm going to repeat that. The girl in the show is obsessed with a refrigerator. And they never explain why. Well, some people can be obsessed with some weirder things. Um, I was obsessed with... Uh, I can't think of it. Weird? She's one of my favorite actors on here. <laughs> that I can't stop cracking up. <laughs> Had to pull a critic. <laughs> Had to pull a critic. <sighs> oh, I'm ready, young boy. Clearly, the little shop of horrors was ahead of its time. Like I said, this has little redeeming value, but I'm sorry, I have to reference a Little Shop of Horror cartoon show in the 90s where the plant raps. I know you think it's a crime it exists, but it's an even bigger crime to act like it doesn't exist. The show lasted only 13 episodes before it was yanked, and you can see why this fertilizer didn't get far. Word, Little Shop! I'm noticing a pattern of characters that most likely wouldn't make a good show. Not making a good show? Were there any existing characters that allowed for clever writing or intelligent dialogue? Yes, really. Warner Brothers was given the task of turning one of their most profitable Looney Tunes, the Tasmanian Devil, into a hit show. How do you do that, though, when his dialogue is mostly... <laughs> Out of all the Looney Tunes, 
I love Bugs Bunny. I love Daffy. I loved all of them, but Tasmanian Devil spoke to people. It spoke to me. I was like, I don't know. Maybe I just liked the weird things growing up. I mean, comment down below if you think that's what you admire or see. But, yeah, I just had a weird thing for Tasmanian Devil growing up. Maybe I should see a doctor. On with the show. Well, they ingeniously make everyone else very well spoken. Even to the point of it being ridiculously overwritten. A children at a portfolio would start with a net yield no less than 36% per annum. There's nothing like a paper in a reclinograph chair for a man after a tough day of doing whatever it is I do for a living. To rekindle the lost flame that connects our souls with the true harmony of the universe. Now I am in a quandary. Technology's the culprit here. Science be blamed. Because of this, not only did Tasmania have a distinct sense of humor, but its writing was surprisingly ahead of its time, along with other shows like Duckman and Simpsons. Yes, really. Based in the land down under where Wacko Warner sings the theme song, Taz lives with his talkative family, interacting with his talkative friends, and partaking in the conversations as little as possible. Much like the other Warner Brothers shows, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking, a lot of slapstick, and like I said, surprisingly a lot of talking. Again, from a show where the main character talks like this. <laughs> but not talked about by many, Tasmania still had an impressive four-year run. It had good animation, good timing, and actors who had to talk a surprising mouthful for a show about a Tasmanian devil. Ferociously intent, not that he's likely to make much progress, given his choice of methodology. We've got house to show, a career seminar to attend, some charity work to do, and a dinner party to prepare. Yeah, my schedule's pretty much open. It's so strange this would be both as funny and as wordy as it is. But maybe that's part of the bigger joke in general, that the most dialogue-focused slapstick children's show was around this guy. Shall we pause to consider this irony? Maybe later. Sadly, there's only a few DVD releases of this show. It honestly deserves a lot more. The episodes you can find, though, are a ton of laughs and had a lot more work put into them than they probably deserved. To put it short, Tasmania is a heck of a spin. Drop the test right, you go. We need you! Nothing. I'm, I'm watching uh, Tiny Tones here in the <gasps> Very innocent, wholesome quality. is up next. But what did that have to do with it? Because that scene always bothered me. It wasn't on Nickelodeon, it was on Fox Kids. And they didn't do stuff like single wheels on the bus go round and round and had good writing. It was a good show. Shame on you, Simon. Shame on you. Oh my god, okay. I'm sorry, I just I never had an outlet to talk about that clip. That always bothered me. It always bothered the cast. So many things wrong about that clip. It was a good, decent show. It just has been building Great. up for a while. It's, it's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. Don't do this to me, man. It's not your fault. Don't do this to me, man. Not your ah! No. I know this reference. It is a Robin Williams reference. Oh. Um, family Guy did it. <laughs> Don't do this, man. Don't do this. This is what I get because I watch too much TV. I get every reference. Well, some references. <laughs> Don't do this, man. Don't do this. <laughs> Woo! Pull yourself together. You, not you, man. It's not your fault. Stop it! Not you! It's not your fault. <laughs> We're tiny and teeny, we're all a little loony, and in this cartoony, we're in baby year TV. It ran it from its third season up. It was one of the few shows based on the younger version of popular characters that branched out not only to be successful and funny, but also obtain its own identity over time. Characters like Elmira, Montana Max, and Furball were all very different from their counterparts, Elmer, Yosemite, Sam, and Sylvester. The nice thing is, while well, in syndication, there was definitely a lean towards being more kid-friendly. But when it went to Fox, they broke out more of the classic Looney Tunes humor. With celebrity jokes, in-jokes, satire, a buster that sounded eerily close to the Crypt Keeper. Tunes from the Crypt! <laughs> it played well. So well that one of the most popular characters, Plucky Duck, 
was given his own show that same year. Yeah, so what was that? It's complicated. You see, the first episode of the spinoff was actually hilarious. They're acknowledging he's getting his own show, but he abandons it to try and beat Batman in Tim Burton's next movie. It's amazing how funny it is. The violence, the satire, the celebrity in-jokes. Tim, I should be Catwoman, you know it! Look at me! Roar, roar. It had a ton of viewers rolling on the floor with laughter. It was so good. Let's stop. Wait, wait, wait. If you're a true Nostalgia Critic fan, he addresses this in his Catwoman review when they're all circled together about how there were many of the people in line to play Catwoman but Holly Berry got it. But I'm not trying to say it's a bad movie. I'm not trying to say I hated it. But I just know that since I saw that reference, I knew it was coming from. Okay, on with the show. That sounds great. What happened? That was the only new episode. They weirdly just started showing clips from other Tiny Toons episodes where Plucky Duck was the focus. So, what was supposed to be the Plucky Duck show just became the best of Plucky Duck. A clip show. Maybe this was filler for a show they didn't make in time. Maybe they only animated the pilot but pulled the plug like what they did with the Elvira show. Whatever they did, it faded quickly, resulting in only 13 episodes. Regardless, we still got a pretty funny first episode and a ton of great material from the original Tiny Toons, giving it a memorable and hilarious run. It's fun. And now our song is done. But not every show gets the attention it deserves. I know what you mean. Oh, I never heard this movie. Homeboys from Outer Space. That masterful work will have its day. But I was talking about Eat Cookie. Filled with Ren and Stimpy knockoffs, Eat the Cat was arguably one of the first. But just like those other shows, it had a similar style, but still its own hilarious identity. The opening sums it up perfectly. He has a dream about helping someone, wakes up to reality, it reminds me and of Heathcliff. Tries to kill him. I watched Heathcliff growing up. That's basically the plot of every episode. The world is trying to punish him for all the good deeds he does. But nevertheless, Eek is always kind and optimistic, always helping people no matter what's thrown at him. It never hurts to help. And indeed, a lot of strange things are thrown at him. It's a world where snacks can blow up in your head. The cereal that pops in your head, not in your hand. Cuddly bears are greeted with machine guns. Who is this squishy bags in the rag over here? And Ross Perot was commander-in-chief, back when that was the craziest person who could be president. There was a mean-spirited creativity to it that was held together Too by just soon. how gentle and Too healthy soon. Eek is. Hey, no swimming for an hour after you eat. You don't want to get a cramp. No matter what, he always wanted to help, even if it meant getting pummeled. Well, at least the beautiful planet of Earth has been spared, and those bad aliens will never do such bad things again, and someone will be here to give me soon. I'm, I'm just sure of it. Hell, the biggest curse word he ever used was Kumbaya. Kumbaya, wait! Granted, as the show went on, they seemed to run out of ideas, so they started putting him in several movie parodies. They were fine, I guess, but it was a little odd, even for this show. To make things even stranger, the time slot was suddenly being shared with another show. Suddenly, it was called Eat Stravaganza, and half the running time was dedicated to Thunder Lizards, a series about dinosaurs who were trying to wipe out a new species called Man. At the moment, there's only two of them, and they're constantly screwing up trying to evolve. I invented this. I call it a washing machine. I figured it out. The fire washes things, okay? Watch. These guys are like the prototype for SpongeBob and Squidward, except the sexual tension might be a little greater with them. When does the hurry stop? The show was pretty funny, but not as good as Eek. Nobody minded too much that the shows were cut in half, as we still got our daily dose of Strange, and the show had a good run of five seasons. Sadly again, though, there's no DVD release, hence the watermark. With the rise of even more surreal humor and internet culture, this really should be more available to the public. It was mean, violent, cruel, relentless, yet funny enough, had a good heart at the center of it. Eek definitely needs to make a comeback, and hopefully somebody out there can make it happen in the future. But there's stuff for dog lovers too. Jim Henson's Dog City, for example, wow. lasted for three seasons. Based on Henson's short film from another TV series, the show opened in the puppet world where an animator created a private eye show about a detective named Ace Hart. It then jumps into animation as Ace constantly battles the gangster Bugsy Vile with the help of Chief Rosie O'Grady and Paper Pup named Eddie. 
As you'd imagine, there's a lot of dog puns in this, which is usually annoying, but after a while, there's so many of them, you're kind of floored so many could exist. I did some sniffing around, trying to get a leg up in the case. I have more bread, beef biscuits, and I'd say Bernard. Drink more! Not much bark, but what about our bite? Station WFIDO. Some bunny was one people scrap short of a full doggy bag. I'm annoyingly intrigued. Like many Jim Henson projects, there's a charm in how kid-friendly it wants to be. For example, the animator hates violence, so guns are usually replaced with rolled up newspapers. And when guns do eventually make their way in, he switches it out for a senseless showdown. It's kind of adorable. I mean, you do want to know what is his senseless, but is it as senseless as rhyming with scissors? I think not. The strange thing is, Fox would do another dog detective show called Droopy Master Detective. Hmm. What was up with this concept? They had the same obsession Disney Afternoon had over ducks. Did they just think this would be the next big thing? Did they even watch this show? While Droopy was camped pretty quickly, Dog City had a pretty decent run. So, I guess if you're a dog detective person, I'm a cat detective person myself. Dog City is cute enough to give a viewing. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if everybody else had this Hooks on Phonics book. And it was called Detective Dog. So, I had a feeling Detective Dog, the Hooks on Phonics book, was based off this Fox Kids cartoon. You know, Critic, I gotta admit, these shows are fine, but they're not really mind-blowing. Yeah, where's the really cool stuff? Well, over the next three years, Fox Kids would have their highlights. They would give us the most incredible, awesome, badass shows any kid has ever seen at the time. Dad, stop butting in! I'm just trying to help. You're embarrassing me in front of my friends! Go away! Okay. I love you, son. Oh. <laughs> I, I didn't quite hear that. I can't hear you. I love you too! No! No! Critic loves his dad! Get out of your dad! You ruined everything! <laughs> Stop it! I do not! Shut up! I think... I think that's the most adorable thing to like... Be embarrassed by your parents! Uh, if you want... <laughs> But growing up, I had this certain nickname. It was after a certain cartoon character. And it was cute when I was five and six years old. But when you're 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and it gets yelled at your graduation, it's a Never let your parents love your parents, but never let your parents say your nickname in public. And I think I need another break. Part three of this video will be out soon. This is the actress VK baby. I'm taking a break. <laughs>